If a female is the one who is freed of parental care, she can produce more eggs more rapidly, and both she and the male benefit from that. As Chicana females cut back on nurturing, their reproductive strategy began to change. Now, it's the females who care more about quantity than quality. Now it's the females who fight over mates. Over time, they've taken on traditionally male characteristics. It's the females that are larger. Females are highly aggressive. Females compete for access to males. And a highly, quote, successful female is one who is able to accumulate and defend, if you will, a harem of four or even five mates. When a female conquers another's territory, she often breaks the eggs and kills the chicks of the vanquished mother. This makes sense, despite its grisliness. The male instantly becomes available to take her eggs. And in fact, that's what happens. Within hours, the female is sexually soliciting to the male. He starts mounting, and within a few days to a week, he has a clutch of eggs that are her eggs. So here is an evolutionary revelation about gender. Male and female roles are not set in stone. They're largely determined by which sex competes for mates and which invests in the young. Solving the problem of how to pass on your genes can even trigger the emergence of a new species. On the tree of life, different branches are often occupied by species that look poles apart. But sometimes, what separates species is more social than physical, as it is with our closest relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos. Chimpanzees and bonobos live in similar jungles in equatorial Africa. They look alike, live in the same size communities, and eat similar foods. Yet, violence is a fact of life for chimpanzees. Battles between neighboring communities are common. So is the physical abuse of females by males. Bonobos, on the other hand, are essentially peaceful. In all instances, bonobos are predisposed to make love, not war. So why are humankind's closest relatives so different? For 20 years, Richard Wrangham has searched for an answer to that among the chimpanzees of Uganda's Kabali forest. Chimpanzee society is horridly patriarchal, uh, horridly uh, brutal in many ways from the female point of view. I mean, the young males, the late adolescents, it's almost a rite of passage for them. In order to be a, 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 an adult male chimpanzee, you have to be able to dominate all of the females. So that's rough from the female's point of view. They regularly get beaten up in, in horrid ways. Wrangham frequently finds himself in the middle of what, for want of another term, must be called a domestic dispute. The most of chasing Barbie, I think that's the set. Barbara's a young female, and she's quite upset about being approached by the dominant male for sex. She's only used, really, to mating the young boys. There's our alpha male, uh, in most cases, not used to being denied, and now he's after Tongo. And uh, uh, his erection, his penile erection, his hair erection, he really wants to get up Tongo. At the moment, she's escaped successfully. Female chimps aren't the only ones at risk. Infanticide is thought by primatologists to be a major factor in the evolution of chimpanzee sexuality. As a response to this danger, females try to copulate with all the males in the troop. The grisly logic of infanticide is disrupted if every male thinks every infant might be his. Under this regime, in which the females are trying to get matings from lots of different males, 
then it's favoured males to have these tremendous testes and large seminiferous tubules for storing the sperm. So uh, they can put in a tremendous uh, number of sperm, about five times as many as humans. It's very high quality sperm. If you look at human sperm, you know, the classic quote is from the vet who picks up a slide of human sperm and says, if this was a bull, I would shoot it. Um, but chimps, by comparison to humans, have very high quality sperm. And they can have uh, uh, five or more copulations per day. The whole thing only takes seven seconds, though. I mean, this is not fun sex by human standards. Bonobos, on the other hand, seem to find sex thoroughly enjoyable. For the past decade, Amy Parrish has been observing bonobo behavior at the San Diego Wild Animal Park. She's seen them go at it in every way imaginable. You get standard heterosexual interactions, which are often face to face, the way they are in humans. You also see what we call ventral upright matings, where a male and a female will hang together out of a tree, suspended, and have sex. Males have sex with other males in what we call rump rump rubbing, where they stand and rub their scrotums together. We also see something among males called penis fencing, where males will suspend off of branches by their arms and rub their erect penises back and forth. And then a very remarkable behavior in which two females rub their genital swellings together in rapid sideways motions. So what's allowed bonobo females to establish such peaceful relations with males? Parrish believes the answer is female solidarity. By cooperating with each other and solidifying their bonds and reducing any tension that does exist, they're able to form alliances with each other and cooperatively dominate males. And this changes the whole balance of power and the whole social dynamic in the group and makes it radically different from chimpanzees. And why have bonobo females evolved a strategy and chimpanzee females haven't? It looks as though a relatively simple change in the feeding ecology is responsible for this dramatic difference in sexual behavior. The bonobos live in an environment where you have herbs much more continuously on the ground. And there are chimpanzees that live in similar forests, but wherever those forests are occupied by chimpanzees, they're also occupied by gorillas. The gorillas eat the food on the ground, leaving the chimpanzees heavily dependent on fruit trees. To get their share, the female chimps forage alone. Mothers with their babies ranging in age from one to about five can't move as quickly as the males. I mean, one infant is up here playing in the tree and, uh, and a couple are, are nibbling slowly and the mothers have to sit and wait for them. So it's absolutely typical that the males reach the big feeding ground first and the males have finished all the food by the time the mothers arrive. So the mothers disperse away from each other and away from the males. And that means they can't have much opportunity to form bonds with each other. The simple fact that there was food available on the ground appears to have been the force that drove the evolution of bonobos. Rangham believes the catalyst was a long-lasting drought two million years ago in what is now Zaire. The plants and the gorillas that depended on them died. It was tough on the chimpanzees, but they could live on the fruit and the trees. When the rains and the plants returned, the gorillas didn't. Now the chimpanzees could get to the food on the ground. In time, they evolved into bonobos. It's been suggested that same drought forced our ancestors out of East Africa's forests and onto the plains. And once you had drying in a savanna area, then conditions became quite harsh. It was impossible for early humans to travel around in groups together in the way that bonobos do, and therefore for females to form alliances and dominate the males in the way that happens in bonobos. But a little bit different climatic history, a little bit different in our food history, and we might have evolved to be a totally different, more peaceful, less violent, more sexual species. Today, this theory is little more than interesting speculation. 
but the idea behind it is consistent with a growing but controversial body of scientific thought that claims much of present-day human behavior is rooted in our distant past. There's a new group of scientists called evolutionary psychologists, and they're interested in how human evolutionary history affects the way we think today. Now, keep in mind that that means four million years of evolutionary history, a time during which we were almost always roaming the plains and forests of Africa. How does that affect the way we operate today? They've been looking at things like mate choice, different kinds of uh, standards of beauty, social exchange, and they have a very long way to go before they can prove some of their ideas, but they're still some of the most interesting and provocative issues around today. Evolutionary psychologists begin by pointing out that, regardless of the culture in which we grow up, we all tend to respond the same way to a surprising variety of things. Most of us find spiders unpleasant, certain body types sexy, and particular smells disgusting. All, they say, are legacies of our evolutionary past. If we ask, for example, do rotten eggs smell bad? It's just a molecule, hydrogen sulfide gas. It doesn't have the smell. We have evolved a brain to generate a negative feeling for something that's detrimental to our gene survival. This indicates biological contamination, right? If you were a dung beetle, the smell of rotten eggs might smell wonderful to you because the smell doesn't reside in the molecule. It e resides in the evolved brain. To an evolutionary psychologist, it's no accident Hollywood turns to snakes when it wants to put a hero in danger. Snakes. Why did it have to be snakes? Dangerous snakes don't slither into most of our lives. Still, more than a few of us share Pretty Indiana dangerous. Jones's instinctual fear. You go first. Another deeply embedded instinct we may have inherited from our ancestors is the ability to smell a genetically compatible mate. In one unusual experiment, scientists had young men sleep in the same t-shirt for a couple of nights until the shirts were infused with their unique smell. It turns out, when women were asked to rate the sex appeal of the different men based only on the smell of the shirts, they consistently rated higher the shirts of men whose immune genes were unlike their own. From an evolutionary perspective, this makes sense. Choosing a mate with different immune genes gives offspring a greater protection against viruses, parasites, and other pathogens. The ability to smell good genes is a remarkable talent. But like most instincts, we don't even know it's at work. We just like the way someone smells, or the way they look, or because they make us laugh. People don't have sex because they want to perpetuate their genes. They don't like someone because they want to get better genes. They do things because they feel good to them. They have sex because it feels good. The relationship between those good feelings and gene survival may not even be known to them. They never think about that. They do things because it feels good, and they never think, why do those things feel good? Why have we evolved a brain that makes certain things feel bad to us, or certain things feel good to us? And that's the question that we're addressing. Like many men, Victor Johnston spends as much time as he can looking at beautiful women. But for Johnston, it's an academic pursuit, part of his effort to understand the evolutionary roots of beauty. You have to remember that beauty is a bit like sugar. In a hunter-gatherer world, the source of sugar was ripe fruit. So if you like the taste of sugar, you got a very nutritional diet. And now we've separated the sugar from the nutrient, the sugar's actually killing us. It's, it's bad for us. And yet we still have this preference for it. Well, beauty may be something the same. Beauty is just a configuration of facial cues that we find to be attractive. These are cues that are telling us something about that individual, something biologically important. People like very full lips, and these are due to estrogens at puberty. And they also like females with short lower jaws and narrow lower jaws. And this indicates a low testosterone level. 
And those, that combination of high estrogens and low testosterone is called 